I got three hours to preach, so y'all bear with me. Uh, open your Bibles to Revelation 1. And on the screen, we will begin with verse number 7, but I'm going to read the verses leading into it from the Greetings Doxology, starting in verse 4. So I read, John, to the seven churches of the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from Him who is and was and is to come, and from the seven spirits before His throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and a priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Now here's our text. Look, look, he is coming with the clouds. The title of the message, The Coming Christ. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patience, endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it through the seven churches to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and in his right hand uh, and out of his mouth came a sharp double-edged sword. Uh, and his face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Uh, and so uh, let's pray. Thank you, God, that you are with us and that you hold the keys of, as it says in the King James, of hell and of death. And I pray, God, that you would help us not have any panic, whatever, and be able to say deep in our soul, it is well it is well, come what may, in this blink of a life on earth. It is well because you came the first time. You'll come again, Jesus the Christ, coming in the great clouds to, to uh, rule and reign for a thousand years. I pray, O oh Lord, let us be ready, God. Let us be ready to go the first time when you rapture the church and come back with you again in your second coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When Jesus came the first time, as I said last week, his glory was veiled. He came to redeem us, but when he comes again, his glory will be unveiled. Uh, John wrote um, from the Isle of Patmos in the midst of the Mediterranean. That was the devil's island. I mean, criminals, that was for them. But John's crime was simply preaching the gospel. And a good probability this will happen to the church and to preachers that will be put not only, it's been happening all around the world, but even here in America, the Christians that are really walking with God will be seen as obstacles to world peace and a segment of society to be silenced or removed. And the church will experience tribulation. You will not escape tribulation. But let me tell you, the church, I don't believe, will experience the great Tribulation, the seven years of tribulation that begins in uh, Revelation, described in Revelation chapter 6. But we will have hard times in tribulation. John 16, 33, Jesus said, But these things I've spoken unto you, that in, in me you might have peace. In the world, it says, uh, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And Paul, in Acts 14, 22, he said, we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. 
There will be tribulation. There will be trials. We already see it. We've gone through the Holocaust all throughout history. You see Christians, and guys, we're not immune. You be ready to die for your faith. You be ready. Don't you think that God has let you down if you have to live your life in such a way that you die standing up for truth and for Jesus Christ. There's, it, it's not, it may not be easy. It's not cheap. It's not a, a lazy way to enter into the heavens. Uh, are to serve God. But if you, if you think you're going to come out unscathed, unharmed, with no battle scars, it's not going to happen. You can forget that. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will face persecution and tribulation, and I want to be ready for it. How about you? There's a time of separation coming. Some who are now church attenders, nominal Christians, call the name of Jesus, they will fall by the wayside when the temperature is turned up. Matthew 24 speaks of a time when the love of many will wax cold as, as the th things at the end begin to shake and begin to happen. At the same time, in the end times, we'll see a great revival, a great awakening with people coming to really coming to Christ, but at the same time, a great falling away. In other words, there's going to be a separation. That lukewarm middle ground will no longer be. You'll have to really take a stand for God to stand up, and that's what we need to do today is take a stand. And all these, as these things come to pass, God will give us grace to help us get through those times. Strength, he'll help us and even joy. We'll be able to say, it is well with my soul. We'll be able to say with Job, I know my Redeemer, and that he liveth, and on the earth again, I will stand, because he lives, and he will raise me up. And uh, those of us that know the Word of God, we don't have to despair. We can say, it is well, and we can say, look, he is coming, Jesus is coming, and all will see. If you notice verse 7 in our text, it says this, uh, behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also who pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Every eye shall see him, it says. Every eye will see him. Everyone's going to see him. And what's it going to be like when he comes in his glory? Well, the Bible gives us a picture, and these words are literally have a meaning, but they're also symbolic in, in, in much of what it says. In verse number 11 in the King James, it says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, or the, la the first and the last. It's A to Z. The accumulated wisdom of God is in Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, so Jesus is, quote, unquote, the alphabet of God, or the sum total of it all. He is the Word. Come alive, Jesus Christ. And, uh, and so Jesus himself embodies the accumulated wisdom of God. And the first thing I want you to see, and you take notes, I'm going to go through some of the supporting scriptures uh, uh, kind of quickly. And, and so you'll need to just make note of them if you want to look back at them. So get your pens ready. Number one, he's the resurrected Christ. Verses 12 and 13, we read there in verse 12 and 13. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about with the paps with a golden girdle. He is not dead. He is standing. He's there. John sees him. John hadn't seen Jesus for 60 years since the ascension. And if you go look at verse number 18, if you jump over, it says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive and forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus Christ looking like one unto the Son of Man, John says. And so uh, he's perfect and glorious and victorious. And Jesus will keep his humanity forever. You will see his nail scar hand, and yet he has risen and overcome sin and death himself and the fact that he was sinless and he won that victory for us. And uh, uh, the only man-made thing in heaven is the nail scars in Jesus' hands. You can see it. And he's going to come back as God the Son and the Son of Man. He died in a body as a man. He rose victorious as a man in his body. He ascended as a man in his body up, and he's coming victorious as a man in a body. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, and God the Son. The same Jesus that was resurrected is coming again for you and for me. Number one, he is 
the resurrected Christ. It's number two, he is the reigning Christ. He will reign forever and ever. Look at verse 13, if you will, with me in Revelation 1. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. You and I have a date with deity. It says clothed with the garment down to the foot and girt about the, the, the chest, the paps, with a golden girdle. That's royalty. That's regal robes. That's a dress of a splendor, the splendor of a king is what he's referring to. And uh, uh, it's the majesty of a judge. This Jesus Christ that comes back. Isaiah 6, one says it this way. I saw the Lord. 6, one. I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. You know, Jesus came and he came and he's our friend now. He came as our savior. And he serves, as it were, as our lawyer, our mediator between man and God. But when he comes again, he's not going to be your lawyer. He's not going to be your mediator. He's going to be your judge, the king of kings and lord of lords. Your Jesus will reign as king and judge. And we will have a date with deity to stand before God. If you die without the salvation of Jesus... Your soul will be in hell before the undertaker hears about it. You may have a funeral, but you won't be there. And someday, your body will be resurrected to stand before God as judge. And he's going to separate the goats and the sheep. And you can't crawl into the grave and pull the dirt over your face and hide from God. God's going to look at you. The Bible says this. It says, the sea will give up the dead which were in it. And death and hell will give up the dead that were in them. And they will be judged, every man, according to their works. You will meet Jesus Christ someday to give an account. The Bible says in Philippians 2, verses uh, 9 to 11, it says, Wherefore God has also exalted him, highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow. As I live, saith the Lord, every knee will bow. He's the resurrected Christ. He's the reigning Christ. And when he comes back, He'll be the righteous Christ. He is the righteous Christ. Uh, he's not coming as a lamb, but he's coming as the lion of Judah. The righteous Christ. In verse number 14 in our text, it says this. His head and his hairs were like, like wool, white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame of fire. Symbolic, right? Not literal, but it means something. It means that he is the righteous one, that he is pure, that he is sinless, he is spotless. The Bible says in Isaiah 118, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, and though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Here's the clue for understanding the verses you mentioned last week, that you understand Scripture from Scripture. Look at the Scripture to interpret Scripture, and here we see when it's describing who, what Jesus is, that there's a symbolic meaning that's a literal truth. Jesus is pure. He's holy. He's perfect. His holiness will be so, so much, so, that, uh, uh, so great that even the redeemed will fall down in silence, as pictured here when John fell down as though he were dead when he stood before Jesus. Too many of us don't know how holy he is and don't see how sinful we are. When you see his majesty, his holiness, then you will see as Isaiah did. Oh, woe is me, a man of unclean lips and among a people of unclean lips. If you think you can stand before him with his unveiled righteous glory, you're mistaken. And if you're not born again, you've had it. Before his holiness, you'll call on the rocks and the mountains to fall on you. Not only is he the resurrected, the reigning, and the righteous Christ, but number three, he's the revealing Christ. And you look at that second part of verse 14, and his eyes were as flame of fire. His eyes were as a flame of fire. It means he had a penetrating vision. You look right, you ever met somebody like, you ever met David Wilkerson? You ever stood right before David Wilkerson? Well, he had that. I don't think he was Jesus. But boy, I tell you, there's something about a person like that. It's penetrating like fire that penetrates and burns 
Today we'd say x-ray vision. He sees right through you. He knows everything you've done. He knows every lie. He knows every dishonest deed, impure thought or deed, every word of blasphemy. He knows every ugly thing you've thought and said, every attitude you've had against others. You can fool your spouse. You maybe can fool your pastor. You maybe can fool your church, but you can't fool God. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He sees right through it. The Bible says about Jesus in Hebrews 4.13, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Good verse to write down and read this week. Hebrews 4.13. He knows. You, he knows you cannot fool Jesus. You can fool an earthly judge. There's a country man that was arrested for stealing a watch. In the courtroom, he tried to prove him guilty. And the judge said, Sam, you've been acquitted. And the man says, does that mean I get to keep the watch? <laughs> you can fool others, but you can't fool Jesus. Jesus can't be deceived, disbarred, disputed, or discredited. He's the judge, and he will remain the judge of all the earth. He's the revealing Christ. He sees all. And when he comes, skeletons will come out of the closet and dance in the living room. Things you thought nobody else knew about you, they're going to know. The newspaper slogan says, if you don't want it printed, then don't let it happen. Not a very nice newspaper, is it? So unless the sins are put under the blood of Jesus, they're going to be revealed and judged. Here's the beautiful thing. When you come to Jesus and you give his sins, he cleanses you and he says he puts them in the sea of forgetfulness, not that he's forgetful, but to remember them no more against you. So guess what? He's not going to bring them up. Our judgment will be of what we've done with the salvation and the grace, the word of God, the spirit of God. It'll be different than those that don't know him. So be sure you get things right with Jesus. He's the resurrected Christ, the reigning Christ, the righteous Christ, the revealing Christ, and he's the relentless Christ. Look at verse number 15. And his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. Fine brass means he will be unstoppable. He'll be relentless. His feet will be a going and a glowing. His feet go forth to judge. In the Old Testament, brass is a symbol of judgment. The tabernacle, the outer court, is a place where sin was judged and instruments were made of brass. The brazen la laver, the, the brazen altar. Why? Because brass is a symbol of judgment. And it will be that he is the relentless Christ. Jesus will judge. He's coming to judge. He's not only Savior, but he's judged. He's a judge. He's the resurrected, reigning, righteous, revealing Christ, the relentless Christ who comes to judge and he is the regal Christ. Look at the second part, part of verse 15 where it says, In his voice as the sound of many waters. His voice is the sound of many waters. Why do I say he's the regal Christ? Well, in Psalm 29, mark it down. Psalm 29, verse 3 and 4. It says this, The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. What a voice. On that day, someday, will perhaps stop the world on its axis as he comes with a shout, a loud shout, a command. Wow, what is it going to be like? His voice, like many waters. You ever heard many waters? You ought to go, when you go to Israel, you stand of the, 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 the north, northern waters when it's come out of the mountain and it just roars. It's just, it's un, it can't hardly even describe it, what it's like. The Bible says that, that uh, all that are in the graves will hear the voice of the Son of God and they will come forth. In Jeremiah, there's another verse, chapter 25, verse 30 and 31, mark it down. And you, you, know, you can imagine standing at the bottom of Niagara Falls and trying to argue back. It says, Therefore prophesy thou, thou against them all these words and say to them, The Lord shall roar from on, on, on high and utter his voice from the holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation and he shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against the inhabitants of the earth. And it says, 
a noise shall come even to the ends of the earth from the Lord for the Lord hath the controversy with the nations he will plead with all flesh he will give them that are wicked to the sword saith the Lord there's going to be a loud voice of God and everyone will rise up uh, so it's a powerful authoritative voice it'll sound like many waters and what a difference in the Christ that comes the second time from the one that came the first time he came the first time to save and redeem when he comes again he would he is coming to judge and he's coming with a loud shout he's coming with a voice of authority he spoke not a word this meek and mild gentle Jesus when he was up on the cross the Bible says he shall not strive nor cry neither shall he lift his voice in the streets but when he comes again he will come in power and glory and majesty and his voice will thunder and we will bow down before his majesty he's the regal Christ and not only is he resurrected and reigning and righteous the revealing Christ, the relentless Christ, the regal Christ, but he's the regulating Christ. In chapter, chapter 1, verse 16, it says of him, and he, he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a, two, a sharp two-edged sword. Uh, uh, he's a regulating Christ. He has got the whole world in his hand. He's in control. He's regulating everything. And he and it says that he had in his right hand seven stars. In verse 20, seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Messengers, angels. In fact, what it's saying is pastors. I'm an angel. Did you know I was an angel? You're not laughing. No, honestly, that's what it's saying. And not, not like I'm an angel, like, like I'm being trying to be humorous with, but literally, that's what it's talking about, messengers here. And so did you know that... Uh, uh, God's saints make headlines in heaven. The world has their stars. John, as he saw all this, was thinking about it, must have been overwhelmed. Even as those of us take the call of God on our lives seriously uh, are overwhelmed, he says, it's okay, John, I'm in control, I'm in charge. When these things come to pass, remember Jesus Christ is in control. He's the regulating Christ. He's the one that's at the controls. He's not a wizard behind a curtain. He's the mighty king of kings that stands before all, and he's controlling everything that's going on. And his voice that is loud and thunderous is a real voice. He's not some fake wizard. And, and the next thing we see is he's the revenging Christ. In the second part of verse 16, it says, uh, 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 And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. It's not a literal description, obviously, of what Jesus looks like here, but it simply means the Word of God, the sword. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the Word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and the hearts and the intents of the heart. Sharp is the Word, the sword. What is he going to do with the sword? He's going to smite the nations with it. He's coming to judge. Chapter 6, it begins the seven years of great tribulation. The Bible says, as the world has never seen, never before, ever. He's going to smite the nations with it. Many people don't realize that Jesus Christ is not just coming back to receive his own, but to take vengeance on his enemies. The, 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 this bothers a lot of people, you know. But, but if you don't understand this about Jesus and his second coming, you'll not understand the book of Revelation. He's not just Savior, he's judge. I've said it many times. If he doesn't save you, then you're condemning yourself, and he will judge. This is a two-edged sword. If it doesn't cut to bless, it's going to cut to bleed, the Word of God. It will cut everyone one way or another, either cut in conviction for salvation or pierce through by judgment. In Revelation uh, chapter 2 and verse 16, it says, And in, he added his right hand again seven stars and out of his mouth with a two-edged sword and out of his countenance was in the sun that shineth in the strength and uh, and then uh, and then jumped to chapter 19 Revelation 19 verses 11 to, to 15 19 11 to 15 it says this and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, 
and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as of a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had the name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of the mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with the rod of iron, and tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his vesture and on his thigh name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the, fowl, the fowls, the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on, that, on the horse, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. Those both were cast alive in the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. That same word of God when he said let there be light and there was light that same word will speak judgment and out of his mouth will come a double-edged sword and there will be judgment to come upon the earth. He is the revenging Christ. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Jesus is not a mamsy, mamsy, pamsy old grandpa. You're not going to go up there and jump up in his lap and hug him like a little teddy bear. If you don't think Jesus is revenging Christ, don't argue with me. Argue with the Word. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 to 10. I think I have this one. It says, And to you who are troubled, troubled rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be, be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels... In flaming fire, take vengeance on them that know not God and, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Wow, that's an amazing passage. The sword, the word of God coming out of his mouth. God spoke, the worlds began, darkness fled, life came forth. And I stood right where that description uh, in, in, in Revelation chapter 19, I stood right in the valley of Armageddon, the Armageddon, that valley right there. I've stood there, I've seen it with people that have traveled to Israel. It's a real place and a real thing is going to happen in the end times. So we need to wake up and smell the roses, people. We need to be a godly, holy people before him. Jesus Christ, the lion, the lion of Judah, the lamb of God, he's coming back. He's resurrected, he's reigning, he's righteous, he's revealing, he's relentless, he's regal, he's regulating, he's revenging, he's replendent. What do you mean replendent? Well, verse 16, this third part, at the end, he said, and his countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. The brightness of his coming is what I'm talking about. The Shekinah glory. The apostle Paul was on the road to Damascus, and the bright light, the glory of the Lord came down. The light of heaven, the face of Jesus, the, the joy of heaven is the presence of Jesus. The melody of heaven is the name of Jesus. The harmony of heaven is the praise of Jesus. The theme of heaven is the work of Jesus. The employment of heaven is the service of Jesus. The duration of heaven is eternity. Focus of heaven is Jesus himself. This book of Revelation written by John on the Isle of Patmos is revealing Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, and he is a coming Christ. And finally, he's a reassuring Christ. Aren't you glad that he didn't just leave us with all that fear of judgment, but he gives us one last look in verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Fear not, fear not. I said, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. And so he's saying, I have the answer. I have the answer for you. You do not need to fear death. You do not need to fear hell. He, we need to do the same as he did, which is fall at the feet of Jesus. Remember Jesus, the one who laid his, his uh, uh, life down for us on the cross. 
And you know, this John was the one that wrote this book. He was the one that laid his head upon the bosom of Christ. But not this time. He's falling down before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Things are going to be different when he comes. I'm telling you right now. And so stick with me one more sermon next Sunday night on this. I'm going to talk about something that you really need to know and, uh, and, and, and to get ready. And then we're taking a break. And then later in the year, I'll come back and I'll do three or four sermons on the book, chapters two and three, which is the things which are the church age. So he writes these letters to the churches. And if you'll look at verse 19, you'll see in Revelation 1, 19, where it says this, write the things which you've seen. That's up till that verse, verses 1 to 18. John saw Jesus. He saw him as judge. That's through right there. So he's written that. He did it. And the things which are, that's the church age, chapters 2 and 3. And then he says, and the things which shall be hereafter. Turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to chapter 4, 1, and you'll see he begins to write it in chapter 4. And after this, I looked up, and behold, a door was open in heaven. The first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet. The trumpet will sound the dead in Christ to rise first, and we which are alive and remain to be cut up to meet the Lord in the air, and forever will be with the Lord. The trumpet, he heard a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and look what it says. The same thing at the end of verse chapter 119. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Hereafter what? The trumpet sounding. Chapter 4 begins the, the point, a picture of heaven in 4 and 5, and then another break will do a picture of heaven. There's where you have all the elders in heaven. You have the people all worshiping. You have the Lamb of God standing. You have them singing, Thou art worthy to receive glory and honor. Chapter 4 and 5, it's a picture of heaven with the saints. Chapter 6, the seven years of great tribulation start, and it describes it symbolically, but it'll be literal judgment upon the earth. And I won't be here, and neither will you, if you have your faith in Jesus. So let's believe it. We serve a great God. Amen?